Okay, so we've now covered all the different elements of Laura. Just so you've got a balanced um, set of facts, we're going to give you an introduction into Sigfox. So, so this is a Sigfox presentation, so it's not an ST presentation, it's come from Sigfox themselves. Uh, and it gives you a brief uh, overview of what Sigfox can do. Reason we're talking to you about Sigfox is because the new router module that's on the center of your discovery board is also capable of running the Sigfox protocol. Now you will have to remove um, one solder bridge or add one solder bridge so that we can connect one of the GPIO pins from the STM32 to the TCXO, which is needed so that we can generate the uh, Sigfox signals through the Semtech radio. So, so this particular module can do Sigfox or it can do LoRa. If Sigfox is all you're really interested in, then ST has a, another product called Spirit 2, uh, which is being specifically designed for the Sigfox protocol uh, and it's a chip level solution so so we can offer that to you as an alternative to the uh, the module here as a dedicated Sigfox uh, product. So what is Sigfox? So Sigfox is a global low power network so just as we had with the LoRa, um, the Sigfox will work exactly the same way. It's designed to be a low power based um, application. So again, 10 years potential battery life, depending on what the application's doing and what type of battery you're using for your um, product. Uh, it's global, so it can be used anywhere. So if you have a device that's connected in France, you can then pick that unit up, go over to Denmark, Sweden, power that unit up and it will connect to the same network, no problems at all. You don't have to change any software or anything like that. It's low cost. So the infrastructure is there. It's out there. It's being installed for you. So you don't have to worry about gateways, network servers, application servers. Sigfox have already created all that information for you. So you just create your node uh, that you want to do your application. And it's very easy to use. So you can connect to it, no problems. Um, you just power up your device. As long as you've got a Sigfox address um, programmed inside your device, then you can connect wherever you are in the world. So all the countries that are highlighted in the purple color are available with Sigfox networks. So, so depending on where you are, most of Europe is well covered. Most of America's are well covered. Um, Canada's not got any coverage yet. And certain parts of Eastern Europe don't have a, a great deal of coverage at this time. So, so what does Sigfox actually provide for you? So Sigfox provide all the areas in the sky blue colouring. So the three items in the middle of the diagram. So you create your object data on the far left, um, depending on what you want to send information for. Then it's picked up by one of the gateways uh, around all the various countries goes into their global network and then depending on what you're doing goes off onto the Sigfox cloud so you log into the Sigfox website and you can see your information that you've got there. If you then want to process it further then you can use any of the main big data analytics platform providers uh, and then it comes out at your computer screens at your end in your office or wherever your end customers are actually doing things. So the structure is actually the same as LoRa. So you have one network server here in the middle. You have multiple gateways connected to that network server. And then you have application servers available to you. So pretty much the three 
sky blue blocks in the middle are the same as the LoRa system. So, so the, the structure is pretty much identical. So there's lots of different um, market segments out there that are using Sigfox. So it's been taken up in different countries with different types of application areas, uh, doing different things. So meet water metering, um, smart lighting, emergency stop triggers, safety cameras. There's lots of various uh, items available that uh, can go into the uh, connect to the Sigfox network. And it's across multiple industries as well. So it can be retail, health and assisted living, public sector, so and so, livestock management, um, anything like that. So there's lots of different marketplaces where Sigfox has already been adopted as a uh, way of getting information from one location to another location. So how does it work? So we're back to the same diagram we showed you uh, this morning. So we have the energy cost and efficiency scale and the uh, range scale here on our diagram. So, so in the shorter range, we've got the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi. Then in the longer range area here, in the WANs, we've got the cellular and then we've got the low power uh, energy efficient um, long range areas for Sigfox and LoRa that are available to you. So the difference between um, Sigfox and LoRa is LoRa was sped spectrum. Sigfox is the pretty much the opposite of this and it's ultra narrow band. So we're now actually using channels that are only 100 hertz wide now to transmit our message. And these 100 hertz channels are only spread across 192 kilohertz of the spectrum. So, so we can pick the frequency that we're running at somewhere between 868.034 to 868.226. Um, megahertz so so we can select somewhere in that small area where we want our 100 Hertz signals to be located we've also got the ability to do frequency hopping as well so the same frame is sent three times on different frequencies so so again to make sure that your message actually does get through to the various base station um, we do have this feature for doing this random access. So that means that your signal is uh, quite difficult to jam because of this frequency hopping that you've got inside the protocol. So here's a spectrum uh, analyzed view of what's going on. So here you can see the three different messages uh, in the 100 hertz wide area that we're sending out for our particular packet there. So it's the repetition that goes on at slightly different frequencies. So as I said, because of the um, frequency hopping as well, um, we've also got very high resilience to interference. So if the noise floor is quite high, because our 100 hertz narrow band signals are quite strong, so 8 dBs of signal available to you, then the jamming is quite difficult. You've got to generate a lot of power if you want to dra jam all these frequencies and you don't know where in the frequency spectrum our 100 hertz are going to sit. So, so it is quite um, robust when it comes to the jamming side of things. Sigfox also has to abide by all the uh, rules and regulations. So it's still in the same frequency band, the 868. It still has to worry about the 1% duty cycle, just as Laura does. So therefore, you are still limited 
to only six messages per hour with your 1% duty cycle. One of the negatives now of Sigfox is that your payload is a, can be a lot smaller. So you're only limited to 12 bytes of payload. Remember, Laura, you can have anything up to 220 bytes of payload. So this is one of the, I'd say, is probably more of a negative on this one. But depending on what you're sending, 12 bytes might be perfectly adequate for what you're doing. So, so it might not be a negative. Downlink wise, you get a slightly different um, regulation. So, so it's a 10% duty cycle for the base station transmitting, but that still means you're only guaranteed four download messages per day. So, so again, it depends on what your application's doing, it will depend on if this is suitable for what you need. So it's a flat architecture. As I said, it's got a very, very similar architecture to the LoRa one, where you have all your nodes, uh, sensors or whatever they are. They talk to the various gateways or Sigfox bait stations. This then goes into the backend servers, which is the network server for LoRa, and then appears on your web interface where you can access your data. So the benefit of Sigfox is they also provide storage facilities. Otherwise, you will have to go to a third party um, storage and data analyzing place so that you can uh, store the rest of your data inside there. Security. So Sigfox also implements security inside the uh, protocol, just as um, LoRa does. So all the information that's getting transmitted um, across the, um, the RF parts of the uh, communication channel are protected by encrypted data. So security procedures are fairly similar. They both use AES-128. Um, so, so you've got a certain level of security available to you within your system. Just like we have in LoRa, you can use any of the big um, IoT players for doing your uh, data analytics and storage and things like that. So Sigfox will integrate nicely with Azure Cloud. So all the information that you send up to the Sigfox network, you can route directly to Azure and then you log into your Azure platform um, to get all your data um, once it's been analyzed and stored and whatever else you need to do. It also integrates nicely with the Amazon Web Services. So again, depending on who you're using as your cloud uh, provider, you can use uh, Amazon. And they've got lots of other partners as well. So IBM, Chariots, Thingworks, Cumulosity again. So there's plenty of certified uh, cloud partners um, that Sigfox already work with. So, so you don't have to be worried that there's nobody out there to manage all your data uh, that you've got. So this is a nice overview slide. So this one will show you a comparison between the two different protocols. So I'm not here to say that yes, which one's good, which one's bad, because everybody's application is going to be different. So potentially both of them can be just as good or both of them can be just as bad. Or if you might decide you don't want to install infrastructure, therefore Sigfox could be better. So really, as well as these parameters, you've also got to think about the business model. So Sigfox is a global network. So the infrastructure has been installed if you're fortunate enough to be in the country where it's already been installed. So therefore, you don't have to worry about installing gateways and things like that. With LoRa, the benefit of LoRa is it means you can have your private network or you can use a public network if somebody's been and installed one for you. So again, you've got to decide that. 
If you choose a private network, then you don't have to pay for transmitting data across it. If you use Sigfox, then you have to register, get a Sigfox ID, and depending on the volume of data will depend on how much Sigfox potentially could charge you. So, so the different business models are the other thing to take into consideration as well as these parameters here on this overview slide. So it really will depend on what you're doing, how much data, how you want to view the data, where in the world the data is going to come from, um, and that will help you in your decision between Sigfox and LoRa. Now we're going to do a demonstration on Sigfox. So, so you can see here I've already logged into the Sigfox domain. Um, so to be able to do a Sigfox demonstration, you have to be uh, a member of a Sigfox because you'll need a um, like an IP address programmed into your target node, and you get these from the Sigfox people. Because we don't have a Sigfox network here where we are today. Um, I am using a Sigfox gateway, which is this rather large steel lump of metal. Um, and this is doing exactly the same as our Multitech gateway is doing for the LoRa network. So it's converting the signals and then sending it over a 4G network back to the Sigfox um, central servers. So I'm not actually um, hardwired in on Ethernet to the Sigfox network. I'm transmitting it 4G and then over to their network in that particular solution. So the backhaul part is irrelevant for what we're doing. All you need to be is to be able to see a Sigfox gateway somewhere, wherever you're wanting your device to go. So now inside my LoRa discovery board, I've now programmed a Sigfox demo with my unique Sigfox registration ID. And if I now click on devices in my Sigfox backend portal, I will see all the ST Sigfox devices that we have registered. So if I scroll down the list, we can see all of our Sigfox devices and when they were last logged in to the network. So my particular board has got address ending C3. So I was last logged in on the 21st of November uh, as when I was doing a demonstration. So if I now click on my node itself, I will be able to see all the different information about my node. And if I click on messages, I can see the last few messages that I transmitted um, over the network. So the software package that we have installed in the Sigfox demo is basically the AT command demo, similar to what we had inside our LoRa one. So I will need a terminal window now. And I will connect to my board. So I'm COM68 9600 board, same as we had with our LoRa AT command demo. And if I type in AT, my board is communicating with me OK there. So I should be able to transmit messages now. So I can communicate with my board. I have my Sigfox gateway in the same room, so I should be able to talk to my Sigfox gateway. So if I now type in AT, dollar, which is what I need to uh, send a message in the uh, Sigfox terms. So SF is then for Sigfox. So if I change my message to be 20, 21, 22, and then comma 1, and if I hit enter, so I've got a library error there, so what I'm sending isn't correct. As you can see in the background, my message has already been received by the uh, backend system. So you can see it came through fairly quickly. And 20, 21 and 22 is my payload, as you can see there in the back end screen. And the comma one means I'm waiting for a reply. But because I got an error on my uh, transmission, 
uh, I'll probably get some uh, very interesting comments back from the Sigfox side when it ever decides to reply. So again, it'll take a while. There we go. So I've received a message. Doesn't mean much, um, but that's because obviously my software demonstration there of that payload is probably actually sending rubbish out in the first place. So I don't know what 20, 21 and 22 in um, ASCII is actually sending me. So, so I've got a very interesting reply back. But you can see now that at 15.03, which is the correct time, on the 19th of the 12th, which is today's date, um, I did send my message and you saw it ping back. So if I was connected to a public network, then I could click on this uh, address location and it would go and show me where I actually was at the time of sending that message. So if I think, if I try one of these older messages, which I did when I was in a different country, it could not be determined yet. So it can't actually figure out because I'm on my Sigfox gateway that's local to me, it doesn't have a geographical location uh, available to it. So if I try one of there, this one might have a location if I remember rightly. There we go. So that was the one that was done in Copenhagen in Denmark. So Copenhagen has a very good coverage of um, signals from Sigfox, so it's well covered by the Sigfox network. And you can see there to prove that I was actually in Copenhagen when I did that particular test. So you can see various informations about where you were located at the time. So I'm assuming this in the Sigfox terms will be like the true location part, which is part of Semtex software within the LoRa protocol.